Hello, welcome to another coding challenge. I'm gonna build a 3D earthquake visualization. You can see it right there. I am gonna do this in processing, which is a Java-based programming environment. I'm gonna use its uh, 3D rendering capabilities. I'm gonna load a comma-separated uh, data uh, value data source from the United States Geological Survey with earthquake data. I'm gonna get an image from NASA. I'm gonna texture it to a sphere. I'm gonna do all of that to build exactly this in the coding challenge. And this is the result that I just did, and I'm gonna travel back in time in a moment and start the coding challenge. There is a big issue with this, which is that um, the actual earthquakes aren't aligned to that particular texture. So that I'm leaving as a kind of challenge to the audience, and I will come back next week on a live stream and show some solutions to that. Um, in addition, the most confusing part of this video is probably this, um, the math behind taking, uh, getting these uh, almost building-like structures to point out in the direction from the center of the sphere, of the Earth, of the globe. And to do that, I'm using something called the cross product uh, of vectors. And so I cover that a little bit, but I expect that that's probably going to be one of the confusing parts of this video. And let me know in the comments whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense, other solutions for the same problem, and I'll come back. Ah, I know what I forgot. Often. Often, if you need to solve this problem, you, uh, the thing you might want to research, and I'll put some links in the description, is something called an Euler angle, or also quaternion. <laughs> and I, I have to run away really fast whenever I say quaternion. <laughs> um, so, but I'll come back. It's just like a, it's a, it's an instinctual thing. It's like the way my brain is wired. But, um, but in this case, I did it in, because these uh, elements aren't moving and sort of turning. I'm able to just kind of like align the rotation. So see how that is. And let me know in the comments how that went. Enjoy this coding challenge, and maybe you'll still be watching at the end. And maybe you'll make a comment. Uh, maybe you'll share this, like it, whatever you're supposed to do to help like the videos get more whatever. I don't know. Okay. Enjoy. Goodbye. Take a ride on the coding train. <laughs> Okay, here we are. I am now going to attempt, and I'm probably gonna do it in a way that everyone's gonna point out how it could be done so much in an easier way afterwards, because I'm already getting some great suggestions from the chat. But I'm going to attempt to redo uh, this previous challenge, which was mapping earthquakes, earthquake data to a two-dimensional map of the world. And I am now going to map that data to a 3D sphere. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, eh, the Earth isn't exactly a sphere, which is true. And there's kind of this uh, distinction between the concepts of latitude and longitude and azimuth, muth, azimuth, inclination. Anyway, I'm going to kind of ignore that for the purpose of this video and really just treat the Earth as if it were a perfect sphere. And then, um, you know, perhaps like you know, people can, in the comments, uh, suggest some ways to be more accurate about that or I can come back and do a follow-up video. But that's, that's going to be a simple way for us to get started with the concept. So the, what I'm going to use to do this challenge is a tool called Processing. And Processing is a programming language and environment uh, built on top of Java. All the syntax that I'll be writing in this code will be uh, Java syntax and the libraries for drawing come from Processing itself. And there's a code editor with Processing that I'm going to use. So I'm going to first just make a, a, a window um, size 600, 600, and I'm going to say P3D. So P3D is allowing me to now have a 3D renderer. So I can start to use functions that are available in processing for rendering 3D. Yay! I'm going to make a background uh, with the, my favorite grayscale color of 51. <laughs> then I am going to say translate because I want, the cent I want the center of my world to be the center of the window. And even in 3D and processing, the default is the top left corner. I'm going to say translate. I could say 300, 300, but I'm going to say width divided by 2, height divided by 2. By the way, I was, uh, I've, I've noticed some people mentioning that uh, it's, it's often better practice. By the way, I'm all about bad practice. <laughs> Bad practice, I'm in favor of. I'm gonna go back um, to multiply by 0.5 instead of divide by 2, since the uh, division operation is you know, trivially sm uh, slower, perhaps. But anyway, the point is I want to go to the center. And then I'm just gonna say sphere, and I'm gonna say sphere 200. And let's run this. So look, there we have our sphere. So this is gonna be the Earth. And what I want to do is I'm gonna say uh, fill 200, no stroke. And by the way, if I do that, what you're going to see is it looks just like a circle. So things in 3D can appear very flat unless you start to change your view of the world and how you're looking at things. So what I'm going to do here also, something that I can do in processing, is I could just say lights. Now there are a lot of functions in processing, and I've got to move over. There's a lot of functions in processing for specific kinds of lights ambient lights, and I can control the color, directional lights, spotlights. So I encourage you to investigate that, but just 
lights is just kind of like, hey, there's some general lighting. And I don't know how well you can see this, but now there's some nice shading on this. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, create a variable. I'm going to call it um, just angle. And I'm going to, right after translate, I'm going to rotate along the Y axis. So one of the things about being in P3D is that I can now, let me move this over a little bit. Um, I can now, um, I can not just ro call rotate, which rotates along, um, rotates just in a 2D plane. I can rotate around the Y axis, <laughs> rotate the X axis, or the Z axis. So rotate Y uh, by angle, and then I can just say, you know, uh, angle plus equals 0 0.05 you know, or something. What we, would, what we should see here, it's gonna be very hard to see. As you can see, now I have my sphere, which I'm using to represent the Earth, uh, kind of rotating around, and you spinning around, you can kind of see the shadowing. So, now, what do I wanna do? I want to place a point on the sphere, and I want to place that point based on a latitude longitude. So um, let's, if you recall, I could, I'm just gonna just, what, what I did in the previous challenge is I, I just kind of looked up something like latitude, longitude, um, <laughs> pick city out of a hat, um, Melbourne. I like to pick cities that I've never been to but hope to visit someday. Uh, so I can pick this latitude and longitude and I'm gonna just put it up here. Now, and now I'm gonna say float latitude equals uh, okay, now I always have to remember, <laughs> longitude are the lines on the sphere that go up top to bottom and go all the way around. So that's really like the X, what I'm thinking about as the X. So uh, longitude is east-west, 144.9631. Latitude is north-south, 37.836. Point, point and when it's south, it's negative. When it's north, it's positive, I think. <laughs> so I'm gonna make that negative. Again, this is kind of irrelevant because it's just gonna appear somewhere in the sphere. There's no, I won't be able to see if it's actually in Australia, but just to get started, let me do this. Now, how do I convert longitude and latitude to an X, Y location? Okay, interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, there are some ways that I could do it. And these, these are expressed in angles. So I probably could do some kind of rotation based on them and translation. Um, and this would be a valid strategy and I encourage you to maybe try that and post about it in the comments. I'm gonna do it using uh, maths, uh, which is, um, by that I mean I wanna look at what is the formula to convert a latitude and longitude, the angle, uh, the sort of horizontal and vertical angle location into x, y, z coordinates. And this is what's known as spherical coordinates. Now again, if I, oops, I had this page open and then I went to a different web page. Um, so if I go to the Wikipedia page, we can find, ooh, where, 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 here we are, ah, right here. We can find these formulas. So I encourage you to read up and look at the derivation of these formulas and how it works. But essentially here, I can look at uh, the radius times sine of the latitude times cosine of the longitude. Now notice latitude it should be between zero and pi, and longitude should be between zero and two pi. So one thing I'm gonna need to do is adjust that range in order to get that full, uh, the full picture around the sphere, uh, because the, the values I'm getting are between negative, you know, negative pi divided by two, pi divided by two. So um, what I wanna do now is I'm gonna say, right here I'm gonna say uh, float latitude equals, first of all I need to say, uh, well, I don't want to call it latitude. So I'm going to call this, um, what, I'm going to call this theta for latitude, radians of latitude plus, um, and what did I say? Uh, plus a pi divided by two, because I want to go from negative 90 to 90 to zero to 180. And then I'm going to say float phi equals radians of longitude plus pi. Then I can literally apply these formulas. Uh, X equals, uh, x equals, where is this formula? Uh, r times sine of latitude times cosine of longitude. r times sine of latitude times cosine of longitude. Oh, and this should be theta and phi. And y is uh, what? Sine, 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 sine. And z is, uh, r times cosine of theta, r times cosine of theta. 
theta. <laughs> and now what I can do is I can, ah, first of all, what's R? R is the radius. How far from the center uh, am I going to position this point? And in this case, I made a sphere uh, 200. So why not actually say R equals 200? Make the sphere with that radius. And then I'm going to say translate x comma y comma z. And I'm going to say box. And I'm going to make a box. That's like uh, box is a function in processing that will make a three-dimensional box. And I'm going to make it uh, 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 by 10. I guess it's just there's only three dimensions <laughs> with height and depth. 10 by 10 by 10. OK, let's run this and see what I get. Where's that box? There it is. So, you know, is this in the right place? <laughs> Unclear. Maybe my axes are flipped. Uh, you know, um, the, the, there's really the question of like, well, what, you know, am I looking at the Earth upside down, right side up? What's upside? I mean, there's no, up, I was having this discussion really off topic here with my children. Like, we're standing on the upside down part of the Earth. It's like, but what do you mean the upside down part of the Earth? It really depends on which way you're looking at it, right? So it is, these are some interesting philosophical questions that I'm not going to get into. But you can see I have now mapped a point, yeah, and my axes are flipped, to, um, to, the, to the Earth itself. So I could, if I wanted to, um, probably, uh, what would I do is make something negative. Maybe the Y value negative uh, would put it on the bottom. Let's try that. There we go. So that's probably all I need to do to sort of flip the axes, at least in this point right now. And that's, you know, somewhere if, if we were look if we, if we mapped Earth, we got, um, we've got Australia down there. We've got Melbourne. OK, so now, now that we have this working, it's just time to go get the data. Whoo, yay. <laughs> Let's go get the data. So I, one thing I'm going to do in processing that thrills me to no end is there is a, uh, there's a whole set of data classes in processing. And you can, there's, there's uh, classes for uh, working with a JSON-based data, XML-based data, just raw text data. But the particular class that I want to use is called table. And the table object is an object that can load a tabular data. And some formats might be um, spreadsheet formats, like a tab-delimited file, a comma-separated file. And it so happens that the earthquake data is comma-separated data. And you might remember this if you watched the previous challenge. What's comma-separated data? Um, I'll show you. <laughs> so, uh, so if I go back to the US uh, Geological Survey website, uh, and I just get, let me just get the earthquakes for the past day. I'm going to click on this link. And then what I'm going to do, uh, ooh, uh, my chat here is not scrolling. Let me go down here. Uh, oh, great. Someone's going to give me some world texture links. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say in setup table equals load table. Oops, and I need to put double quotes. And then I'm going to paste that link to the CSV right there in the code. So let's look at uh, processing.org load table. I think I spelled that wrong, but he found it anyway. So this is what comma separated data looks like. It is, uh, it often has a first, a text file that has a first row, which is header information. So an ID followed by a species followed by a name. And then each of the next rows would be uh, rows of data. So there's uh, a goat with an ID of zero and a, and a species, a leopard with an ID of one, a zebra with an ID of two. So, um, so this is the kind of data. Now, what, what does the um, earthquake data look like? I can actually just paste, whoops, I can just paste that URL into the browser. It's not, it's going to download that CSV file. And then I can open it in Mac Preview. Oh, look, there's only one earthquake. I better get some more data. So it's fine. We'll, we'll use this just to start with. And you can see what the, what the data is. It's got a header row, time, latitude, longitude, depth, magnitude. And then it's got the data itself in the next row. And if there were many more earthquakes, there would be uh, many more uh, rows. So I, don't, I, I, oh, I did only significant today. So I did only the significant, uh, which is there's only been one so far. But this is good for us to start with. Um, okay, because uh, so now what I'm going to do is one thing I need to do in the load table function is I need to go to the end and add comma header. This is a second optional argument to the load table function that tells processing, that tells load table function that that CSV file has a header row. And this is incredibly useful because now we can start to ask for data by name. It will parse that 
uh, it will parse the tabular data with the knowledge of that header row. So in, uh, in the draw loop, what I want to do now is say four, and I want to iterate over all of the rows of data. And each row is, can be accessed in an object called a table row, I think. For table row, row in table.getRows. So this is kind of a fancy, uh, maybe that's not right, table.rows, table.rows. So this is a very fancy kind of loop. <laughs> this is a loop, a, a, a Java enhanced loop that's like a for each kind of loop that says table.rows returns this iterator object that kind of provides you all of the rows. And this loop says I want to look at each row one at a time. And then for each row I can start to get data. Like I can say float lat equals row dot get float latitude. So this is what's so incredibly useful. If I load a CSV with header information, I can just access the data in each row based on what the header's name is. And I can also, uh, if I know what kind of data it is, whether it's a float or an int or a string, I can call a particular get function. Then I can say float uh, longitude equals row dot get float. And you can see, by the way, I have code completion turned on in the processing IDE. So this is a feature of processing three. So it's um, and a longitude. And then another thing I might want is uh, um, magnitude. So let's just do print line lat long magnitude just to see that, that that data came out. So if I now run this sketch, I should see in the console, ooh, there is no column name magnitude. So I didn't pay close enough attention. The, the column name is actually just MAG for mag, for magnitude. So if I come back here and change this to mag, and now if I run it, there we go. Oh, it's printing it over and over again, but you can see that data is coming in. Latitude, longitude, and uh, magnitude. So now what I can do is take, we don't really need this. This was just for testing. I'm going to remove that, and I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to take this code, and I'm going to put it right here. So now I can, whatever I get from the data source, I can now apply my conversion to XYZ. Now here's the thing. If this is going to work now with just one box, but ultimately I'm probably going to want many boxes. So these translations, that translating to XYZ needs to apply to each individual earthquake that I'm accessing. So in order to not have the translates accumulate, I need to add push matrix, which is saving the current transformation state. Then I translate, then I draw the box, pop matrix, which restores it. So when it comes back to do the next one, that previous translate won't affect it. Okay, here we go. We should see uh, an earthquake somewhere. Now, I, you know, I, I probably should, number one, make this box quite a bit larger. Um, maybe what I want to do is say fill 255 to, um, is that the same color I have for the sphere? I don't know what the sphere is. Yeah, so you can see there it is. There it is uh, on the sphere itself. Now, let's go grab a lot of earthquakes from the last month. Uh, and I'm going to go back to the USGS website, and I'm going to go to past 30 days all earthquakes. It's probably a terrible idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm now going to uh, put that in here. Whoops. I'm going to... One thing I want to do is I want to just leave both in case I need to do testing at some point. I'll comment out the one day significant. I will paste this in here and save. Now I'm getting everything for a month and I'm going to run it. We're going to see a lot of spheres. Look at this. There are all the earthquakes mapped all over the uh, sphere. Yay! That looks kind of reasonable. Let me, um, let me change that now to make the boxes a little bit smaller. Okay, so this looks more reasonable. Now, there's a couple things I want to do. I want to now angle, I, what I want is for the boxes to be extruded out based on the magnitude. Now, I could just make the whole size I could just, so I have a, like a cube. 
right? The box function only will ever draw a cube for me. What I actually want to draw is something that can be like this. Boy, I can't draw at all. <laughs> but you get the idea. Oh, what did I do? You get the idea, right? I want to make, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Whatever, I'm making it worse. Um, I want to make a, uh, like a tower. So box is a really convenient function to use because it gives me, boom, just a box. But for, to make this kind of tower thing, what I need to do is design my own shape. So this particular shape I can create myself by saying begin shape, end shape, and then I could set a whole lot of vertices. So if I think about one of these planes just in the bottom, this could be like the point negative one, comma, negative one, comma, uh, negative one. Like if it, uh, and then this could be the point over here, one, comma, negative one, comma, negative one, right? If this is sort of Z, I could kind of just figure out, and I could, I could make a quad for this part of the, of the, I don't know what to call this, tower? It's almost like a cylinder, but a box cylinder, rectangle, what is that called? That's like, I gotta have a name. <laughs> I'm a lunatic here. Um, everyone, is just going by, I'm seeing all the YouTube comments now. So um, I could set all the points for this quad, then 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 this quad. How many quads is that? It's six. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna come back over here and, oh, box takes three arguments? <laughs> thank you, chat. So I could, could do that, but let's take a look. Oh, thank you, that's wonderful. Let's look at boxprocessing.org. So that's how you would have to do your own shape. <laughs> but and now seeing that I can actually give it three arguments. And the three arguments are width, height, and depth. So I think um, what I'm going to do is, okay, so let's just, um, do I have the magnitude here? I have it in mag. And remember, uh, magnitude for an earthquake is based on the Richter scale. So what I need to do is, um, and then of course I have to think about the volume of the, but let's not worry about that too much. Let's just think about the height mapped to magnitude. So what I'm going to do is say float h equals power 10 to the magnitudes 10 to the power of magnitude. Um, and then I can do a mapping, which is if I say like max h is, I think I used you know, 10 to the 10th power, I can actually just say h equals map itself from zero to max h to between you know, 10 and uh, 100. So now what I'm going to do is I can say, uh, maybe the width and height are always gonna be, maybe I want the height to be h, and the, the x and z dimension, the sort of width and depth, will always be five. So let's see what I get there. Uh, okay, oh, so I can't tell um, if this worked. Let me, I, let me not worry about this actually for a second. Let me just see if I can make some tall ones. Um, so I'm gonna make some with like a height of 100 and a width, okay. So this is doing something, but they're all pointing straight up. So here's the next issue. I want them to be pointing, oh, and this is like a hard problem. So if this is my sphere, and I have something right on the edge of the sphere, it's right now it's just pointing straight up. I want it to point out as if there was a ray shooting from the center of the sphere to the edge and continuing straight out. So I have that ray, it's the vector, it's, it's position relative to the center. I need to rotate this box to align it with that particular ray. So I probably could apply the rotation then translate out again, but I'm gonna attempt to do this with some math. So one thing that I need, I think math-wise to do this, is I need a vector which is just the axis, like a kind of like a, a sort of normalized axis that I can relate everything to, and I'm gonna make, use it as the x-axis. So I'm gonna make a new vector, which is the x-axis. So a vector that's a unit vector pointing along the x-axis, uh, x-axis is just one, zero for y, zero for z. Okay, now, where, where am I here? Now what I'm going to do is I want to look at the um, angle between the x-axis and the, the vector itself. So if this is my vector, 
I want, if I, I'm going to rotate kind of relative to the x-axis, I want to rotate it like this, based on that angle. So the nice thing is there's a function in P5 that uses, I'm sorry, in processing, but also in P5, that uses the dot product behind the scenes, another vector operation that I have some video tutorials about, that give you that angle between. So what I want to do here, what I want to do here is say uh, P vector angle B for angle between. But that's really, that's really like the, um, I don't want to use angle because I'm using it already, like, um, yeah, uh, angle between equals p vector dot angle between the x-axis and pause. Now remember, pause is that, oh, there is no pause. I'm saying pause. I have to make a pause. p vector equals new p vector, pause dot x, pause dot y, pause dot z. That position vector is the vector that points out from the center. Uh, pause. No, what am I saying? Pause. Ah, I'm doing this like I'm losing my mind. X, Y, Z. <laughs> the pause equals that P vector X, Y, Z. Ah, okay. This is good. This is good. So now I want an angle between the X axis and pause. What could you possibly be complaining about? Errors. Float does not match. Oh, yeah, yeah. The angle between is a float, not a vector. It's just a float. So by the way, uh, what did I, uh, let me, just so you can see that, it gave me this error. Type mismatch, float does not match with processing.core p vector. So if you get an error like that, it's because this function, angle between, returns a float, and I said to set it to a p vector, which makes no sense. What I want to do is establish a, a, a vector, which is what I'm going to rotate around. So for example, if this is the x-axis, this is me rotating around the x-axis. And what I want to do, if I come back to over here, right? What I want to do if I want to rotate, if I want to take this and I essentially want to, I don't, I want to rotate it to this point. I want to rotate um, around the axis that's actually perpendicular out from these two vectors. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this. This really needs um, a more thoughtful diagram. I'm going to try to explain why we need the cross product here. So let me diagram out what we have so far. We have the x-axis, and then we have a vector, and I'm going to use dot to note that this is coming out, as if it were coming out like this. This is the position. But actually, a way to think about that, let's say the position is on a two-dimensional plane like the x-axis, right? So what I ultimately need is to, oh, this is so good. This is good. What I need is to rotate this like this, right? This is what I'm drawing, a box that's pointing straight up, and I want to rotate it like this to match that direction. So I need an angle to rotate it by, and I'm going to be able to get that with this angle between. That's the angle that I need to rotate it by. And maybe if I'm actually drawing it this way is a better way to think of it. So I might actually need to fix the box to be drawn this way. And I want to rotate it like this. So what axis do I need to rotate it around? This axis, right? I need to rotate it around this axis. Now in this case, if it was just 2D, I know I could just rotate it around perfectly the Z axis. But what I want to do is call rotation around an arbitrary axis. So let's say this was actually, so instead of the position being on the same plane as the x-axis, what if the position we're pointing out here, the axis that I want to rotate out is now perpendicular out maybe this way. The way I get a vector that is perpendicular to two vectors that are connected is with something called the cross product. Okay, so let's look at a diagram that I think will help explain this. This is, if this is vector A and this is vector v, B, this is showing you a, and, and those vectors make a plane, the cross product is the vector A cross B points out perpendicular from that plane. So this is exactly the operation that I need to do to get that rotation axis. So if I come back to my code, I should be able to say now, a rotation axis, I'll just call it R axis, R axis equals uh, X axis, dot cross uh, position. And now, here, ooh, what did I get wrong? Oh, and that's a vector. 
right? So the cross product returns a vector. The angle between function returns an angle. So now that I have the rotation axis, I want to rotate around an arbitrary axis. Now, how do you do that? Let's go look in the processing reference about rotate. Oh, this is exciting. <laughs> Processing.org. Because this is maybe a feature you weren't aware of. There's this rotate function. Rotate is a function that you give it an angle. Look, it rotates. Now, it only says the only thing you can give it is an angle. But there's also like rotate x, huh? And that you can give it an angle and rotate y. So built into processing are rotation functions for specific axes. The x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis. <laughs> x, y, z, OK? So those are built into processing. But I want to rotate around an arbitrary axis. Well, this is um, not documented here in the, in the main reference, but this is actually a feature of the rotate function. You could find it if you look at the Java docs for processing for certain like advanced, more advanced features. What I can actually do is I can say rotate, and I want to rotate by that angle. Remember, I want to rotate by that angle around an arbitrary axis. I can say r axis dot x, r axis dot y, r axis dot z. So the rotate function can actually take four arguments, which is the angle of rotation and the x, y, z of a vector of an axis of rotation. And I think I got that right. It could be that the, ang the angle is last. I'm pretty sure the angle is first. So let's now run this. Oh, but I don't want to do the rotation here. I want to do the rotation right here. So after I translate to that location, I want to rotate. So let's now do that. And we can say, ah, now that doesn't look right. It's certainly rotating, but it doesn't look right. So I think the issue here is that I didn't draw. What, it, what I did is I drew my, oops, wrong, wrong. I, if I have that earth, and I, had that, I, I kind of drew my boxes pointing up, but then rotated to the x-axis. I, I think I need to draw the boxes um, with the extrusion along the x-axis for this to make sense. So let me change that to the boxes, the extrusion, the value that's larger being the x value. And there we go. Ah, it worked. Oh my god, I'm so pleased. <laughs> that was really painful, but totally worked. Um, and I'm very pleased to see that that worked. So now, in theory, what I should be able to do is have the height be mapped to the earthquake's magnitude. So let's put that back in and uh, make this h. And there we go. Now, I guess I don't have, <laughs> OK, so I'm not really able to see the distinctions very well between the particular earthquakes. So I'm going to kind of fudge it here. And I'm going to say, like, well, I'm probably actually not, there's really not any um, earthquakes right now in my data that have a magnitude of 10. So I'm going to just really consider the maximum that is like of, of a, on the Richter scale of 7. And then I'm going to map those ones that have a, a, um, of a magnitude of 7 to 100 pixels and the lower ones to uh, 10. And if I do that, we should see here I'm getting some variation. So you can see there was one particularly really large earthquake uh, and the other thing that's going on here is I've drawn these boxes actually via the center. The center is on the edge of the sphere. So there's actually a ray going all the way inside, too. So that's probably skewing the stuff. So I think we would have to be more thoughtful about the relative scaling of these. But you know, we're getting something, you know, whatever that data might be. You might not have earthquake data. You can sort of see what the possibilities are here. Uh, I could add color. I could add textures. I could be much more thoughtful. Let's do one thing just to see how kind of problematic what I've done is in a way if I want to actually see the you know what what we typically look like as the earth so I need to find a uh, a nice texture image to texture that sphere so let me go look for that okay I'm back I found there's a lot of places on the internet to get images of the earth I'm going to attempt to use one from NASA uh, nasa.gov visible earth um, I you know there's so many uh, Possibilities here. I'm just going to grab um, November or uh, I don't know December blue marble next generation, and I'm going to download the image here. Um, I want just sort of the smallest one right now, so I'm going to download this one and I'm going to hit save, and I'm going to go to my um, where is this project saved? Earthquake 3D. 
Um, let me save this to the desktop. Earthquake 3D. And then I'm going to save this to Earthquake 3D. I'm going to make a data folder. And I am going to uh, save this image. I'm just going to call it uh, world earth, earth.jpg. OK, now, one thing I want to do is I want to check the dimensions of this image. So I want to go to processing and go to look at that image and do it, get info 5400 by 2700. Eh, sure, why not? <laughs> Let's just see if that works. Why not? I said I wanted to check and then I'm like, whatever it is, it's fine. So here's the thing. I can actually texture this sphere very, very easily. I think I might need to bring in a P-shape object. So let's just see. First, I, want it, I need an image, and I'm going to call that image Earth. And then in setup, I am going to say Earth equals load image Earth.jpg. So now I have access to that image in the computer's memory. Just to be sure that this is working, I'm going to say image Earth 00. zero. So now I'm just going to kind of draw that image in the background. And we can see, there it is. There's an image of the Earth somewhere in the background. I've got that image loaded. Now, in theory, what I would want to be able to do is just say texture Earth right before I draw the sphere. But that doesn't work. So the way that I, uh, you can't, I don't, I don't believe in processing. It works to automatically texture one of these primitive shapes. A sphere actually is a shape that's built up by many different uh, triangles. Um, but what I can do, however, is create a P-shape. And I'm going to call that globe, because I already called it something Earth. And I'm going to say globe equals create shape. And then I think all I need to do is say sphere, and then give it, let's make the radius uh, a global variable. And then give it a radius. I think this now just creates shapes. This is a shape object that is a sphere and that has a radius. Now, I should be able to say here where I'm drawing the sphere now, I should be able to say, and let me get rid of this texture. I should be able to say uh, shape, shape globe. So I'm drawing, instead of drawing the sphere as like, and actually this is much more efficient because instead of computing the sphere geometry over and over again, I have this sort of saved sphere object that I'm just, uh, drawing into the, into the scene. So there we go. Now you can see the sphere there. Now I haven't, now I, it has a default stroke and it has, a, a, which is black, and it also has a default fill. So what I want to do, first of all, is I want to get rid of drawing the Im, the, that image. And I want to, um, I think I could say no stroke, and then I think I can say just globe.texture and then that Earth image. So I think now this will give me that image of the Earth. Mm. Um, actually, the function is not called texture. I forgot it's called set texture. Um, that's the way to set a, set a particular image to auto texture that particular shape. So now let's try running this. And there we go. So now you can see my Earth is textured with that image from NASA, and the earthquakes are on it. However, I have done something rather incorrect, which is that if I kind of zoom in and look at this, these earthquakes are just not in the right place. If I slow down, let me slow down this rotation. And because if you remember from that, there's a lot of earthquakes that happen along, at least um, along the California coast of the United States and up into Alaska. And I think um, we'll be able to kind of see that collection of earthquakes. Here it is. That's that collection of earthquakes that kind of goes along. With, it's, I'm, I haven't aligned the texture with the sort of XYZ transformation. So this I'm going to leave as a challenge, as code will get published, to figure that out. And you know, number one is I, I probably don't need to flip this Y, maybe. Flipping this Y, there, I might need to do something where I kind of rotate the t Earth into the right position to align. So I'm, not, I'm, gonna like, I'm gonna research this. I'll come back next week and show on the live stream um, solutions to this particular problem. But, um, but, and also, here's the thing, regardless of that Earth texture, there's so much that you could do with this. What other kind of data could you map to a 3D version of the Earth? 
what other um, what other ways could you visualize the earthquake data? Color you could certainly use, you know, particles emanating. Um, you know, you could time lapse and show earthquakes over time over a very long period of time might be interesting, or other kinds of data. So hopefully this gives you, this, this tutorial gives you a sense of how to work with 3D, how some of the math can get kind of tricky when you start dealing with vectors and rotations, and also just a little bit about working with data in processing. Okay, thanks very much. And I'll see you in a future coding challenge, I hope. <laughs>